Welcome everyone to Almost Cancelled, I am Peter and today I'm going to be talking about Doom Patrol Season 3 Episode 1. It's called Possibilities Patrol. So, full spoilers for the episode, and this is a weird one to come back to. I'm obviously delighted that the show is back. I love Doom Patrol. It won us all over, I think, in Season 1 and 2. But Season 2 did have that kind of weird ending because it was cut short where they had to wrap up production because of the pandemic. And there were some, you know, questions as to, like, had they altered that last episode much to try and make it fit as a more of a cliffhanger? And what would this returning episode feel like? So, uh, th th today we get to kind of have a look at that. They, they did put out the first three episodes, so it's going to take me a few days to get all three reviewed. Uh, hopefully I'll get it all done in time for episode four hitting next week. But... This is effectively kind of the finale to season two, more than it is a premiere to season three. Although, having now watched this episode, I I do think they did move some things around. I think the big cliffhanger with the candle maker at the end of last episode, I feel like that might have been juggled around so they had a big ending to like have their cliffhanger on. Because uh, this one felt like it had a lot of stuff that was wrapping up plots of the season. Even the last five, ten minutes felt like I had like a sort of epilogue feel of like, this is the end of a season, uh, we're going to be moving away from these characters for, you know, however many months, maybe a year in real time. So this is setting up what they're going to be, and not that it's a year in their story, because it's like a week later when it jumps ahead for the final scene, but you know what I mean, like that, that like, we're leaving them for a while, so here's what we're setting up for them as they all go on and do their own thing, they've all got their own plots that they're wrapping up. Uh, so this did feel like a finale. The only thing it didn't have finale-wise was that the big action spectacle kind of came in the season two finale, which... So I, I do think they might have moved some things around to make that work, but there was a lot to wrap up. And it was a little bit of a challenging episode uh, for them, I think, to pull off. Mainly because it has been a year or however long since season two's finale aired, and getting back into the groove of all the plots that were going on, and remembering all those details. I'm not going to claim that I remember all the details, necessarily. Uh, but the episode did a pretty good job of sort of like sliding you back into each of the character plots. Uh, the big one, which I think we have to start with, is Jane. Um, the Miranda stuff. Uh, this episode revealed that Miranda is just kind of a part of, of Kay, and always has been, and that maybe the Candlemaker uh, kind of, you know, awoke in it once again. Uh, but it's, it's effectively her self-doubt. And I, I think what's so good about this episode, and my favourite thing about this episode, is... And it's something that the show's done before. It's something that the show has kind of done before, obviously, especially with, uh, with Jane. Is... Effectively what this episode boils down to with Jane, in terms of the, the, the crunch towards the end where there's a crisis, it has to be solved, and there's the dramatic kind of build-up to get into it in time, is that her self-doubt... Miranda, like Miranda takes control of, of the body, of Jane's body, and is going to kill herself and end it all. This is simply a story of self-doubt winning and about to kill, like someone about to kill themselves, and their confidence and their other, like, well in this case other personalities, one in particular is leading the charge, but they're all kind of banding together, right? Uh, that's kind of the uplifting idea of it all. But when you think about what this is actually representing, all, all the different personalities getting together, standing their ground, making sure Jane can fly off in the plane to get to the surface because the, the train's been sabotaged. And all, all of this is, is really kind of strong, uplifting stuff because all it really is, when you really think about it, it's the inner struggle of a person who's thinking about committing suicide and the stronger, more positive parts of that person's personality or psyche or whatever you want to call it are just trying to win out before it's too late. That's what's happening towards the end of this episode. But we get it in this big spectacle, dramatic, you know, movie style thing where there's a last stand being made and a show of strength with all these people together. And it is very a big deal. And I think... You know, Miranda and Jane's body sort of like disposes of everyone, well not everyone, but the ones she runs into quite quickly, 
And I love that there's no one else around for the most part, until obviously Cliff like catches her, because she does kind of come back into control when she's already kind of coming off the, the table. But the actual drama, the actual build-up, isn't people yelling at her and trying to talk her down. Like, you usually get in a, in a scene like this where it's, um, like, someone's about to commit suicide and they're trying to talk them off the ledge or, uh, or whatever it may be. But here it is just, she's on her own and her foot's about to go over and it's all this inner struggle. It's, it's, it's really good stuff. It's just, you know, it's another example right away just to remind us all what this show is good at and why it can be so dramatic and, and dare I say profound, despite the fact that it's got such a silly, wacky sense of humor and everything else. So, uh, wonderful stuff. Um, I love that Kay is becoming more of an active participant. Kay herself was helping push the plane. Kay herself had to come and wake up Jane because Jane finds everyone else, like, play, you know, just doing the jigsaw. And she gets tranced into doing the jigsaw as well. Miranda's winning. And it's Kay who now has the, the, the soft toy that Jane went to go get at the end of last season and is able to kind of wake Jane up and kind of... And that in itself is this very powerful idea. Kay is the real person. And the idea that Kay herself has to be the one to snap all of the personalities out of it and save herself is also very touching and it, it does kind of suggest that maybe one day k can regain control maybe one day k can go to the surface again um if there's a happy ending for this character by the time we reach the end of the story it's k being the person again right that that, that kind of feels like they're... so all that was wonderful um it's it's wonderful stuff um if, if i have a complaint about this episode honestly is that for the first like maybe 20 minutes yeah, it's, like, it's almost a full hour for the first like 20 minutes sort of you know getting my bearings because it had been so long since season two was a little bit of a you know a little bit of a challenge at the start it was kind of, I kind of had to like, let it all sink in again uh and also it, it does feel like a little bit poorly paced early on it feels like it so quickly goes from resolving the big cliffhanger to, oh, everyone's got their own plot now, and we're dealing with the kind of the, the quiet downtime of everyone, uh, that it felt really odd as a, from a from pacing, it felt a, bit, a little bit jarring uh, to jump to that so quickly. But once it built up its story, and once it got to its meat and potatoes, it was really, it's, but with the Jane stuff, I'd say that is really the main plot, and it's the main dramatic beats towards the end. But there's a lot of stuff uh, to, to bring up as well. There's a lot of things to get into with the others. Uh, Candlemaker stuff. Again, the idea that Dorothy's the one who just talks down the Candlemaker and says, we're not leaving here until we're friends again. <laughs> and she has some semblance of control, which does make her a little bit scary. And there is a line from uh, Cliff or Larry early on where, yeah, you know, you know, we don't want to piss off like the... the the, the power that's inside her because she could, she could just ruin us all and take over the world effectively but yeah they're all they all wake up from their wax prisons at the start and it's all very nice um but the individual character plots rita is tasked because because uh niles is dead calder's dead and the one part of the episode is that dorothy doesn't want to uh, dispose of his body until jane wakes up so they've got him surrounded by frozen peas on a table, which is so Doom Patrol. Uh, the, uh, so they kind of stall, and Rita actually gets a, like a box and a letter from, from Niles uh, saying that he trusts her to kind of carry forward the secrets and kind of be the leader, and specifically gives her this key in hopes the day will never come. The day actually ends up being quite soon. It's about a week from now, uh, funnily enough. But, uh, yes, so... Uh, and she sort of struggles with that. We get kind of the, the joke payoff to her play, which is doing the... It's like a musical version of what happened in season one. Uh, which... Honestly, like, this stuff... Like, the, seeing the play again, it had been so long that it, it kind of felt weird to return to this joke. This is the sort of thing where if this was if this did air just right after, you know, a week after the last episode, and I've been probably more into this, but because I was trying to, like, get back into, like, all the, the, the plot details, if it, this felt like such an unimportant thing to return to. I'm glad they did, though, because the, the, the character who's here, who's playing the Rita, the fake version of Rita, uh, her sort of scene at the end, it was nice to reintroduce her for that. So like, it did serve a purpose, and I, I did laugh at the end, because Rita makes this big monologue, uh, which has nothing to do with the play. She's just struggling with what Niles has given her and the, the responsibilities that she's maybe taken on. 
and her guilt over never kind of expressing her feelings for him. Um, not to suggest anything romantic, just her, you know, their, their, you know, their, their, their friendship, their, their family connection, whatever you want to call it. Um, but as she's walking away, she storms off uh, after her face starts to, you know, sag, and the, the donkey, you know, the, the two guys in the donkey suit, there's like a farting effect they've got on the play where it's sort of, there's like a puff of air that comes out of it, and that happens at the end of the scene. That 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 did make me chuckle. I'm not going to lie. I I got a kick out of that. Uh, and her her story you know, ties into what little Larry has this episode, which is Larry kind of like the spirit is telling him to to go, and it's it almost sounds like you know go as in like, it's time to move on from this 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 plane of existence. Like maybe it's time for Larry to die. Uh, obviously, it's, it doesn't feel like it's strictly that though. Um, and Rita hears some of this conversation that Larry's having with the spirit, and at the end of the episode, kind of, like, says, no, like, don't let me hold you back. Like, I hope you come back, and Larry hopes he comes back, but, you know, he has to move on and do this new thing. He's ready for this next step, or whatever this is. And we get this nice shot of him flying through the air. Uh, his skin kind of reappears. Whether or not that's really happening or more of a symbolic thing uh, it could, could be left open just now, I think, but really simple stuff that obviously we're driving towards his next big step, which, you know, having read some of the comics, I feel like I maybe know where they're going with this, although I don't know for sure, because it, like that would be a bold thing to do in a TV show uh, for a couple of reasons, so. um, But yeah, and Rita, of course, once we have the weak time skip at the end, this alarm goes off and the keys uh, keychain starts lighting up. And it leads her to a, 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 the keyhole is like in the bookshelf, in the in the main room. She opens it and it's like a, a really old time radio or telephone style thing uh, that's flashing and it's saying something like a arrival imminent or you know something to that effect. Something's coming, and she is about to pick up, but she's too late. Her, her hand uh, actually melts, you know, like, I guess her, her confidence isn't quite there. It kind of gives in as she reaches to take, to literally grab hold of this responsibility. And she kind of shrugs it off and goes, well, I bet, I, I bet it wasn't anything important. Uh, which, of course, is, you know, the, the most ridiculous thing she could have uh, assumed. Uh, which is where we cut to her new character, her new, you know, villain uh, of the season. Uh, Madame Rouge is the character's name, but uh, Michelle Gomez, who you may know from the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, you may have seen her on Doctor Who, she's been in a bunch of things, uh, you know, t TV particularly, but over, over the last, you know, decade or so. Uh, I, was, I think she's been working a lot longer than that, but certainly the nerd side of the world has become a lot more aware of her in the last decade or so. Um... I was I was happy to see her use her own accent, uh, and not because I'm Scottish, just because like I've heard her try and do an American accent, and it, you know, it it, it cracks. Like you know, when when I was watching Sabrina, you could kind of hear the Scottish accent kind of seeping through it a little bit. And in those cases, I always just wish like just let them have their own accent. Does it really? For most characters, it's not actually that important where they're from. It's not a big deal. It doesn't really change anything that they have a different accent than maybe intended or different from the rest of the cast. So, yeah, cool stuff. Uh, and it's, honestly, this was this was a perfect Doom Patrol introduction scene because you have the wonderfully over the top. I'm going to call it Technodrome style entrance, where this actress who was playing Rita is all hyped because she finished her musical and they did a big song and dance and she's still sort of singing it on the way out and she's so happy and the ground begins to shake and crack. It's like a little mini earthquake. And these big drills come through, a little mini technodrome, and out steps Michelle Gomez. And looks around for a second, and then immediately just pops a squat, and starts pissing in the street. The actress is just stunned, and eventually she looks up at her, and sort of, sort of goes, hey, could you uh, give me a hand here? And she hands her her, her program from the, from the performance, and... Well, with a smirk on her face, Michelle Gomez just rips a page and then goes to wipe. And the thing that, and this is all, you know, that surreal type, type of like Doom Patrol kind of like crude but knowing humor that it, that it often has. But what works so well about this and what put it over the edge for me 
was the patting sound effect at the end. Like, she doesn't just wipe. There's, like, a patting sound effect at, after after that. And that's what really put it over the edge and kind of made me go... <laughs> like, I, 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 I really started laughing. And then it's revealed at least part of her power set as she kind of shapeshifts into this actress. The actress is so freaked out that she actually falls into the crevice that was created by the, the Technodrome coming up. So she falls down into the pits of the earth... And Michelle Gomez, she turns back to herself, and it made me wonder if they're going to, like... Obviously, we're going to see her own face a lot, but I was wondering, are they going to, like... Is she going to keep going back to this actress's face and sort of assume that identity as her main disguise? And that's, you know, that's why we've made a, a point of really introducing her here in this episode. Uh, the actress, that is, just to sort of remind us of, of who she is and what her point is. Because they, they knew, when, when they made this episode, they knew that it was coming after such a long gap. So they, they knew they had to kind of slyly reintroduce certain things to make sure stuff worked. And, that, and that's uh, that's cool. And that's smart. That's, that's what they should do. Uh, so I'm wondering if, you know, that she will be using that face a lot. Or it could just be a, hey, this is an example of her doing this so you know she can, so that when she starts to do stuff. And she's looking for nails. That's the other thing. She's looking for nails. Doesn't know he's dead, of course. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, Cliff... Head over to Cliff. Uh, I'd forgotten how much I loved hearing Cliff uh, yell an F-bomb in a quizzical way. You know, he's questioning what is happening with an F-bomb, as he often does. Uh, sometimes he'll say it in a full set, and sometimes he'll just say the word. I mean, it's delightful every time he does it. Either way, it's just, you know, it's, uh, I have no complaints. Uh, he actually speaks to Nails, because Nails shows up as a ghost. And this is like... <laughs> This is, like, the least cheap way I've ever seen a character just suddenly pop up again as a ghost in something. Because they've established the sex ghosts, like, so much, <laughs> this did not even feel like a surprise. It was just kind of like, of course. Of course. Of course Dale showed up as a ghost to talk to, to Cliff. And it's a pretty solid little scene where he talks about um, how he, he needs to move on and he, his body has to be cremated for him to, to finally sort of leave uh, and he's asking cliff because he doesn't want dorothy to have to say goodbye again it's been too much for her and cliff may actually enjoy burning him so <laughs> maybe he's the best bet but it kind of turns into a conversation about um uh their their history their past uh cliff's effectively given up on his daughter because he doesn't think she'll forgive him for missing her wedding and and nails is like i've been alive for over 100 years and if there's one thing i've learned is that there's almost nothing that can't be amended. There's almost nothing that can be forgiven. So, you know, keep trying. And what may help is that before I died, I messaged her uh, some of the tapes of of your, like, story. You know, the tapes we've seen of him with his, with his tests and his interviews uh, to kind of explain what's happened to him, why he's been where he's been, and sort of give it some context. And he also hoped that it might even mend their relationship, you know, his relationship with Cliff. And Cliff says, like, there's nothing that could do that, I don't think. But, thank you. So there's kind of, there's kind of a sweet moment. There's, there's, there's a back and forth. Um, it kind of comes kind of hearty. And it almost does kind of feel that maybe this is a goodbye for Niles this episode. Now, obviously, the ending, the mid credit scene, says otherwise. But uh, it does kind of feel like this could be a goodbye in many ways. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of made peace with giving Rita, like, leadership, and she's probably the one who feels the most... Either her or Larry. It had to be her or Larry. There was no way Jane or Cliff could be leader of the team. That, that, that just wasn't on. Um, I mean, I suppose Cyborg could be, but Cyborg is pretty young, and he sort of... Cyborg thinks he's the leader, but he's a bit in over his head at times, and that's kind of, like, part of his charm as a character. So, yeah, it had to be Larry or, uh, or Rita. So, so Rita makes a complete sense as a choice. Um, So... So that stuff's cool. Uh, Cliff does go to see his daughter, who's had birth. Had birth? Given birth. You know what I mean. Have a baby. Uh, which he finds out in a really funny phone call, where there's a lot of F-bombs, and she apologizes for dropping one, and he immediately goes and drops his own right afterwards. Um, but it's a nice scene. It's a nice scene where they, they are mending. There's this arc of him. I and mean, I'm sure he's still going to mention his daughter. I'm sure being part of her life is still going to be something we talk about, but... Oh, pardon me. But I'm sure that this is the end of the struggle just to be in her life. It feels like he's gotten there now. And now it can be, you know, something that's there, uh, an assistance of other plots uh, with Cliff. 
perhaps. But we'll see. I mean, I don't know. We'll see what we've got planned for him. Um, but it's a, it's a good, it's a good moment, good moment for him. Uh, and as as far as nails is concerned with the with the ghost stuff, is that I think it's interesting that Dorothy did not burn his body. She takes him to be buried uh, next to her mother. Uh, Danny, the ambulance <laughs> takes takes Dorothy. Uh, to oh. Oh, God, I've forgotten where. It's been too long. It's been too long. It did come up in the subtitle. You know, there was a caption, but I've forgotten. Anyway, uh, whatever that happened, whatever all that stuff happened. Uh, but, of course, we, we the mid credit scene reveals that uh, Willoughby, who it's delightful to see him again as well. It's always nice to see Willoughby. He's actually dug up Niles and has his severed head <laughs> and says the world's not done with him yet. And that's kind of your tease that we're going to be getting more Niles in some capacity. Uh, and given the rules of this show, it makes sense. It, it actually may add a little bit of weight as well to Niles actually trying to make amends with Clef, given Rita this leadership. He already said goodbye to Dorothy. Um, it, it's kind of a nice idea that he actually does try to do all these right things and say his goodbyes, but he's sort of dragged back into the world anyway and has to kind of deal with that, like, unwanted continued existence. That even in death, he can't just rest. Uh, and apparently even in death, he can't even get laid because uh, the the final joke after this scene is that he's sitting in the in the mansion as a ghost and <laughs> the sex ghosts are up in the ceiling having sex and he just kind of says hello and then the, the lady sex ghost just kind of like, you know, motions him up to join the party and he's like oh no i shouldn't and he's like ah what the hell and he starts undoing his bill <laughs> and then he fades away because now he's presumably been dragged back to the land of the living because he's been whatever willoughby's up to is is brought him back from ghostly form so he he almost had some raunchy ghost sex and it was ripped away from him <laughs> at the last minute which is pretty funny so uh yeah, I mean, all that stuff's good. Uh, I, guess, I guess we've left Cyborg, uh, who has just, again, it's just a little bit, he speaks to his dad briefly. Uh, mostly, it's just kind of wrapping up that he's still uh, involved with this Ronnie character. She it was going to blow up the building. He stopped her, um, who I think was the people who did what, you know, you know made her different. Uh, admittedly, like, my, va- my details on this are very vague. Um, I remember their relationship. I remember... Um, you know, the sort of turn of it and all that, but the actual details of her past uh, uh, is, is a little on the vague side. Like, I, I didn't recognize the name of the company. You know, that was the thing that kind of made me go, oh, I definitely don't remember the details of this because when it came up with the, the building's name, I was like, oh, I get that may sound familiar, but it's one of those things where it's been so long. Uh, but you get the gist of what's what, what the point is from the character and that he is looking out for her. Um, so, and is trying to stop her from crossing lines. So, you know, something I'm going to continue with uh, this season as well. Um, so, yeah, it, honestly, it's hard to be uh, disappointed. I would say that, yeah, it is a little bit rocky. Uh, for, and not rocky in, like, a, it's a complete terrible. I, I just mean it's a little bit rocky from a pacing point of view. It feels jarring to come back down to kind of mid-season episode pacing after it quickly wraps up the Candlemaker thing at the start. But... Once it builds to where it's going with the other plots, and specifically Jane, uh, it, that that stuff is great, and it's exactly the sort of thing that makes Doom Patrol freaking special and fantastic. And then the the tease, our new villain, the Technodrome, and the 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 piss patter, as as I'm going to call her, <laughs> that stuff is great. She seems like a lot of fun. Uh, the actress is is very charismatic and. Pretty much always plays a villain. She's she's got those eyes and that sort of like mean face that just makes her typecast as a as a as a villain, I guess. Because <laughs> she's all every time I've seen her in something, she's a villain. I think. Uh, I think I maybe saw her in one small movie role where she wasn't a villain, but every other time it's been evil doctor or, or uh, evil witch or whatever she was from well she wasn't technically a witch I don't think Sabrina but that, that, I can't say what she was that was spoilers territory uh, and then here she's well we'll find out <laughs> we'll, find, we'll find out exactly what Madame Rouge is and why she was in prison actually that was the other thing I really liked about that is that I think the phone call 
uh, sort of, and the warning saying, you know, arrival is imminent. Uh, and I think because in this show we've been to space before, and I think because we just saw uh, Larry fly into space, I think there's a a natural assumption that there's something landing from space. So there's something coming into Earth from from outside of it. So it was actually kind of an almost a neat little twist that it was actually something coming from within. It was something coming from the core or whatever uh Madame Rouge has been has been hanging out for probably decades or centuries. So yeah, I'm I'm very excited to see what they do with this and I'm curious to kind of sort of get into season two proper with the next episode. But you know, this episode didn't have an easy task ahead of it. It had to kind of wrap up things uh, but without maybe the more action climactic element that was probably originally intended to be mixed in with it a little bit differently. I, I could definitely see a, a scenario where the original way it was maybe planned is that a lot of that Candlemaker stuff was maybe playing out uh, alongside some of the Jane stuff. Because the Jane stuff didn't really need a lot of other... like It needed all the other personalities inside her head, but it didn't really need the, the other characters on the outside for the most part. Um, like, it wouldn't take a lot of rejigging to kind of, you know, so I, it wouldn't surprise me if that was originally the thing, but I, I think they did an admirable job, uh, you know, not with a few pacing bumps early on, but ultimately, the story beats they still had left to play out to conclude Jane's plot were still excellent, and that nothing diminished that uh, in the episode, so... Uh, let me know what you thought of episode 1 of season 3 of Doom Patrol in the comments. Like and subscribe, ding the bell for notifications. All those things do help out a lot, so please hit them. Uh, you can support us financially as well over at patreon.com slash TV for as little as $1 per month and help keep all the content coming. So please do consider and have a look. Um, otherwise, you can head over uh, to Twitter at mail underscore fuzz for channel updates or you can get me specifically on Twitter at wibble89. Uh, but otherwise, uh, that is me. So thank you very much for joining me. I will see you guys next time. It's always a pleasure. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?